All right, welcome everybody. This is season four, episode four of iMOOC, and we have some great guests tonight. We are joined by John Spencer, who is the author of Empower, and he's been a regular joining us this season, which has been awesome to have his insights. And we have two other guests. We have Eric Shigela, the principal of Vista Innovation and Design Academy <laughs> in Vista, also known as Vita. So for those of you who have been reading Learner Centered Innovation, he is featured in chapter three, I believe, and the work he's done at the school. And we also have Kayla Brashad, who is the director of High Tech High and has done amazing things and is just really one of, a phenomenal leader. So we are excited to have both of them here tonight to share their experience, their wisdom, and certainly to make you laugh and possibly cry and who knows what else. So we are going to get started. Oh, and I'm Katie Martin. I'm here. Most of you know me. I'm the author of Learner Centered Innovation and excited to be here to host and um, chat with these guys tonight. So I'm going to start with John to give us a brief intro of who he is and what he does. And then we'll move on to our other guests. All right. Hey there. I'm glad to be here. I am a former middle school teacher. I did that for about 12 years. And um, now I've been at George Fox University for almost three years. Um, I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm passionate about uh, design thinking and project-based learning. And I know um, the uh, two guests that we have here are also in that same zone. So it's just going to be fun to kind of geek out on this topic and, um, and see how it goes. Yeah. Awesome. So why don't we go to Caleb, give us a little bit of an introduction of who you are and what you do. Sure, sure. Uh, I too, like John, was a middle school teacher, math and science teacher, also taught uh, English language development in the hood in Riverside County um, here in Southern California. Um, and now I am the director of the Gary and Jerry and Jacobs High Tech High. It's a um, it's kind of this place where we love to dream, we love to disrupt systems of inequity. Um, we love to uh, do badass work. And I'm a cog in this beautiful machine, and uh, I love serving our people and our community in doing so. And we do it well. Awesome. We're super happy to have you, Caleb. And Eric, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where, what you do and tell us about your school. My name is Eric Shigela. I'm the principal of the Vista Innovation Design Academy, or VITA for short, for those who Vita! don't know. <laughs> Vita! Vita means life in Spanish, which is super important to us. We're striving every day to have school be more about the life of the young people who come through and that we serve every day, as opposed to just a place that they show up for seven and a half hours. Uh, when I grow up, I'd like to be Caleb Rashad. Um, he is the most yeah. interesting human in the world, I believe. And I actually get to co-teach a class with him um, at the High Tech High Graduate School. We teach a class called Innov uh, Leading Innovative Schools, where primarily we talk about design and we talk about culture, baby. Awesome. I told you, you guys are the perfect people to have here because um, just the work you do, I'm so inspired. And of course, I have to share not only are you amazing leaders but two of my favorite people and two dear friends so i'm super happy to have you here um i want to start with you eric a little bit about um you talked about vita is a school that you actually created this school and as i'll mention it was a traditional it's in a traditional public education district it was a very traditional underperforming school that I visited when I was had student teachers at the school. And over the course of a year, you have transformed it and really made it a place where kids and teachers and parents all want to be. So talk a little bit about that process and like how you use design thinking to really create um, a new culture at your school. I think one of the great things about design thinking and what led the hearts of the faculty there, because we did this all alongside each other, is um, when you work at really impoverished schools with high needs, you're automatically highly empathetic. 
And if you're not highly empathetic, then you have no place there and you're not going to be able to survive. And so coming from uh, a, a foundation like that, the faculty, I think, enjoy the idea of design thinking because A, it was different. B, you can see every content area in that. You find your place in that. But also the focus on empathy was was automatic for them. It made sense. And so that was something that um, the use of design in design thinking specifically in the structure of the school, but also then as a pedagogy and how we approach opportunity and um, create more personalized learning experience for all kids through that just really made sense. It was wonderful. And it's all about culture, hope, joy, grace, love. Mm, mm. Good stuff. And you know, and you say love, and I and Caleb, I want you to talk a little bit about this too. One of the things you say often is like, you just gotta love the hell out of people, and um, I think that's really important. And often people will ask me, well, like, how do I get people to change their practice? How do I get people to do things differently? So I'm gonna toss that one to you, Caleb, and like talk a little bit about in the public school where you used to work and high tech high. How do you help people? really think differently about their practice and and do things differently yeah a great question so um gosh so i think in my in my first school um, where i was an administrator i learned a lot from my mentor her name was sonia risley and i watched how she was able to transform manure into magic <laughs> She could take like these like seemingly disgusting sort of elements and like work them into the soil of like the school and like grow something fruitful out of that somehow. And I was like, oh my God, how do you do that? And so watching her for several years and then having a chance to go to a school that was at a top down superintendent, the instruction in the school was top down. The principal that was there before me, she was the top down. And so um, it kind of bred this sort of culture. I mean, and I'm going to like name cultures about the among the people. They were, in their words, um, toxic, unhealthy um, in a lot of ways, a lot of backbiting and suspicion and competition that was not healthy and so part of this thing about like um loving loving people is more about like deep compassion for people and connecting people to themselves like why do we do this work why do we subject ourselves to this work um and then what's our collective story and then what are the what is the work that we really want to do that speaks to both our intellectual and emotional selves and my my dissertation is all about relational trust and how principles um, say and do things um, that elicit trust from the faculty to the principal and among the faculty members. And so um, uh, I just recently shared a, a quick um, excerpt that I just read out of Strength to Love by Martin Luther King um, as a way to just kind of like understand how to take do change at scale. And one of the things he talks about in there is this idea of love being more than just friendship love and love being more than um, romantic, romanticized love, but rather this sense of agopic love, like this sense that um, I have your goodwill at heart and I'm gonna work in that vein with you um, collectively and individually. And so really the secret to change um, I think is bared out in the annals of history and all the theory that you read about. It's in the human relationship stuff. And it's, it's like, I see you, I hear you, I got you. What do you want to, in the words of my good friend, Mike Strong, build, bash, and break? So this is both anybody. I'm like, when you're saying it's the change is all about relationships. And you're saying that you we really need to make sure that we understand who people are. What do you do as the leaders of buildings, as the leaders in, you know, as a professor? What do you do when people above you who are mandating things don't understand that and they're telling you to get something done? How do you support yourself?
Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so I think the first thing that I did when I arrived here at High Tech High, I've only been here for two years, but it was something I learned from Sonia several years ago. And it is this idea of creating psychological safety for people. And that is generally done through like dialogical sort of protocols, creating ways for people to be able to speak in their truth um, without fear of criticism and judgment and castigation and all those. And even before that, it takes, in my mind, at least um, in the places that I've been, it takes a leader person who has the role authority um, to be vulnerable him or herself. Show yourself. You have to like stand up for what you believe and what what you really feel, and you have to be able to articulate that. And then you have to like stand up for other people to create a space for people to critique. For other people to speak their truth, and then for us to speak our truth together. So I think in, in this way, you sort of build momentum to really like do work that is meaningful. For sure, thank you. And I'm wondering, John or Caleb, how do you, how do you really get people to, to move when you, like the system doesn't necessarily support it? How are you supporting people who you work closest with? background so, sorry so I'll, I'll kind of jump in here i think um I, I love hearing this perspective right now because i i was never uh in a leadership position like i was always in a teacher leadership position i was the one who created programs um, developed systems um, we were a low income title one school district all that kind of stuff um, and there were constantly battles about, you know, mindsets, right? Like these kids can't do blank, and that drove me crazy. Or um, we can't do this because sixty percent of your teacher evaluation is the test score, and all, I mean all that kind of stuff that I always heard. And um, so, from a teacher's perspective, like a teacher leader perspective, it really came down to the fact that there were times when a leader was willing to risk something, right? Like a leader was willing to be courageous. And in those moments when that happened, and I felt even more freedom to innovate, then it was like a breath of fresh air. But it was hit or miss. We also had toxic leaders who like, you know, like Caleb described, like where it was ugly. And so the, the thing that I tell my pre-service teachers is that being a teacher, if you want to be innovative from day one, like if you want to be different from day one, then you have to be part sage, part lunatic, right? And the sage is the one who quietly knows how to get things done, how to work within the system, how to be quietly subversive to change things. And then the sage, you know, and that's the sage. And then the lunatic knows how to like jump in there and just be disruptive and sometimes be vocal about like, no, this is what's best for kids and we are going to do it and I am willing to risk it. And I think that the, the art from a teacher leadership perspective, and again, I, I readily admit I was never in, in, a, in a principal type position, but from a teacher leadership perspective, the art of that is knowing when to be the sage and when to be the lunatic. And I think when, when you figure that out, then you have this beautiful thing where change starts to happen from a grassroots level. Katie, I think one of our big things is around engagement and having come from the school that uh, we transitioned from a traditional neighborhood school to Vita, which is still a district public school with all the constraints and all the issues, which actually helped breed our creativity, I think, was we knew that the kids had to be engaged, but even more importantly, we had to engage the adults in the work that they wanted to do. And one of the things that we said a lot early on is, what have you always wanted to do with kids that you haven't been allowed to do it? And let's figure out how to make that happen for you. And so that's been really exciting to watch 
you know, and we and we have to do stuff. I know Caleb still even his position has to do this of shielding people from what just gets in the way and hampers their work and you know let us be the brunt of the stupidity of the system so that we can focus on allowing people to really do what they were hired to do their creative geniuses and how do we help unleash and unlock that for each of them even if they don't know it's inside of them how do we have those conversations around building that sorry i muted myself so i didn't hear the crackle there <laughs> um, I love all of those perspectives and it's really about, you know, as a leader, you can really embrace people and be vulnerable and show that. And I think that's super important. And John, I think that you're as a leader, you know, a formal leadership authority, teachers are leaders in so many ways and lead in the classroom and need to be able to also have that that cover to be able to be innovative, but also when you don't have it, step up and do it. And I think that Caleb and Eric, you have really shown how to create that space. You can have those leadership from the classroom and support that culture collectively. Um, and I think that those things are really important. Uh, I'm also just wondering, something that is part of One of us has a microphone that's plugged in. Sorry guys, I'm not sure. It is, but it's it's crackly. So everyone check your sounds. Momentary break. Um, but I want to talk about. I think something essential to all this is strengths. How do you build on? Like really, not just say everyone's good at something. Let's build on that. Like how do you really create a culture that actually leverages and builds on the strengths of the people in your building? I think it kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the engagement aspect, because the strengths, interests, and values of the individuals is how you really get to that engagement aspect, that hope for them. And so first you have to provide the space for people to be aware of what, what are our strengths and that they do have strengths. I think there's many times there's such a humility of teachers that they don't necessarily think that they're excellent at anything or that they're able to create something beautiful. I just come and I do my, job or I teach this math or or that and so giving them the space and the capacity to understand that they are brilliant at something that they are beautiful human beings that they are creative that they are dynamic and allowing them an outlet for that love that and how do you feel like has design thinking helped you guys to do that like how how have you really moved cuz i what i feel like is fascinating to me eric is you actually started a school oh you i mean you kept the same school and you created a new name and a new vision and guide and and principles but everybody stayed i think that's another piece that i want to highlight you didn't get a whole new staff you kept the same building and you kept the same staff and they had the chance to leave but they stayed so, I mean, I think that's the same kids matriculated through. Right. So, I mean, I know people are interested in this because I hear this all the time. We talked last week about innovating inside the box and people are thinking you have to get a whole new building and you have to redesign everything. And you didn't do that. You are like, you are a leader who has stayed and kept the same kids, the same building. So, I mean, let's, let's talk, talk a little bit more about that. Give us some insight. How, how does that happen? <laughs> I think a lot of it's um, what Caleb hit on the head about loving the heck out of people. Um, when I came to the old school, I was told, just smile, like just smile at people. I didn't really understand that until we started digging in. And then when we started talking about change, like that smile and loving them. And it's not like, like when Caleb talks about love, He's a former U.S. Marine, <laughs> football and coach football. And we always have this thing, like when we present together, like he's a Marine and football player and I drink Coors Light of a can and I dig bologna sandwiches. Like we're not super touchy feely people, but if sometimes if you hear us, you think like we're oh, these overly emotional, um, whatever type of men. And that's why I love when he framed around like the Gothic love that it's not just soft and nice. Like it is this brotherly servantly, like we love you to no end. And there's a reason for that. And we're family and we're going to get through it. 
And when people talk about like culture, because culture is a big part of the, obviously all this, um, I this this saying that culture is not a nacho party. Like people think like, hey, we had a, we go to happy hour once a month. That's fantastic for you. Tell me what you're doing for people. How are you attending to the needs and the love and care of people? Do you know the names of the children that they have at home, their real life situation? Are you able to talk to them in the hallway? What is your actual presence as a human being? And so design thinking fits into all that because it is all about being human centered, human centered design and um, caring for the needs of others, identifying what the needs of other people are and your users and your extreme users. So who is not bought in? Who's overly bought in? What are the needs that they address? And there's so many tips and tricks for culture from design thinking, from yes and and improv type stuff to um, just providing great skills and norms and protocols for uh, brainstorming and ideation that you're able to really bring everybody onto the boat and help them find their voice in it, in that discovery. And what I found is when we go away from our process and we forget it, we sink. Yeah. And when we go back to what we believe in, then we rise up. Yeah, dude, you just totally nailed it. And just to highlight some of the some of the key pieces there, I think like when I've I've been in my my first school where where the curriculum was prescribed, teachers in fact the curriculum was um, created in such a way was to make it teacher proof. Like no matter what, even if you get a sub in there, the sub is going to be able to walk in, understand what the lesson plan is and like mechanically administer the learning. Right. When you're like constantly in this receivership experience as a professional, your capacity, your ability, your creative muscles atrophy. You quite literally go, you become a, a, a consumer yourself and you pass on consumer sort of habits to students. And what lacks is the ability to dream. And when um, I, I had my, my, my first school and in my school now, what I see is the major difference is that the people here in this place They've been bred to dream a lot. And m more than that is that design process um, centers on like three important mindfulnesses, right, in terms of process. One is the disposition toward empathy, like understanding the, 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 the human experience and surfacing that unarticulated need in some way as to be able to then, process number two, dream about what might be possible in order to meet that need in maybe a low um, stakes kind of way so you can learn quickly and then test it. Like that, I, that, that cycle of empathy to insights to um, dreaming about possibilities and then doing something is in itself a cycle of innovation. Uh, I think I was probably most, like most of, of your listeners, um, just blown away by Ken Robinson's talk some years ago about um, does schools do schools uh, kill creativity? And the way that he describes it as a process never dawned on me. And to be able to run across a process by which we can go from ideas to action, um, I don't know. I think it serves as you know a one means of engaging in um, innovative work. So I want to jump in a little bit with this too. Thank you. That that's that's super interesting to hear that perspective. Um, and I think there's this cross section between um, when we think about experiences in the classroom. And so um, I know John writes a lot about this and has just provided a ton of examples and resources for what teachers can do in the classroom. And I know Caleb, you and Eric both support that. So I'm thinking like how. So we talked a lot about educators and the culture. What does this look like in the classroom? How do we create these experiences in the classroom to really unleash talent and to really empower the, the kids, the students, the learners? All right, I'd love to kind of dive in here and say like a lot of what I'm hearing um, with school culture and with teachers are the exact same things that work with, with students, right? And so, 
um, like I, I, I think I, I kind of got into design thinking, gosh, it was a little over a decade ago. And, um, you know, we had been doing a lot of projects, but the focus was on problem solving, not on, not on empathy. And um, I remember we, we were using it for a, a service learning piece. And again, we were a low income school. Um, you know, I had my students do a, a community needs assessment. They looked at you know, the number one issue um, that the community felt, even if this wasn't the actual number one issue affecting the community, the number one felt issue was graffiti. And the one group that took ownership of the empathy process had a totally different solution than everybody else. Everybody else had watched, you know, community watchdog groups and and uh, video surveillance and this and that. Well, we had a really tight budget; like we had to keep it under five hundred dollars, right? So whatever solution we had was small. So there was this creative constraint, and one group came up with a solution built around empathy, built around interviews with people who actually did tagging. And they found that people leave art alone. And so it started this whole movement of covering our campus with murals. And they were like, the murals were not touched. And that's the difference between empathy driven design versus problem solving, right? Two vastly different things. And um, so I think that's part of it. And then the other piece is, Really, someone early on gave me this, my, my friend Javier gave me this ad advice, and I love it. He said um, that there's a good chance when you run into a barrier that, that the answer is not to figure out a way around the barrier. The answer is that the barrier is actually part of your design feature. And that was really hard for me. But I remember we, we would geek out on, and this is going to sound stupid, but um, we would geek out on baseball stadiums, right? And so just bear with me for a second this is totally like baseball geekery here you could be like john you're so full of crap but just bear with me the astrodome was a futuristic stadium built far out in the suburbs built with a huge budget and and 20 years later it was completely out of date because they focused on being futuristic and and moonshot dreams right like and you're always taught like, moonshot dreams this and that. on the other hand Camden Yards was built around constraint. They didn't have the money to um, demolish the warehouse, so they incorporated that into the design. They brought back this idea of quirky field dimensions. They they um, you know blew out the outfield so that you had a view of the skyline. And if you ever watch a game at Camden Yards, this is a beautiful place to watch a, a, a baseball game. And so I think that's the other piece is understanding that the constraint is sometimes not just something you work around, but it's actually something you incorporate into your design. I, I love that. And I think that, Eric, you have done one of the most exceptional jobs within those constraints. And, you know, you have a middle school. A lot of times I see middle schools and they have to get through their 45 minute blocks and you go through seven teachers a day and kids are exhausted and disconnected by the end of the day you have the same requirements you have the same structures you have the same compliance driven system but you've done some really interesting things at your school based on the teachers and the kids like i think of the design studios and some of the other um, things that like totally connect to what john just mentioned you want to share some of those yeah, so we, in middle school, typically like a period is 47 minutes or something. And we knew that that wasn't going to be good enough. And so we were trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do we bounce a lot of balls? How do we get the number of minutes in that we need? Because kids still need math, no matter how, you know, whatever. And we still need to do history and we still need to do science and we still need to do English. But we want to make sure that we're engaging the kids and the adults every single day. So we went to a rotating block schedule, but we invented these classes called design labs, which are essentially their elective classes. And we didn't think that based on a rotating block schedule that kids going to these great innovative classes three days a week would be enough, or that teachers going to these classes three days a week would be enough. So 
we we drank a lot of whiskey and we got a lot of arguments and we really tried to figure out how we make this work and again going back to this idea of like the process somebody eventually after two weeks of us not be able to figure it out said we're not using our process we're not using our process that's why we're frustrated that's why we're stuck that's why we're not generating good ideas that's why we're kind of stuck in the box of what we've always done and so as soon as we went back to the process within about 15 minutes we had it solved and so what we did is these these <clears throat> very exciting magnet classes that are generated by teacher interest and so you get enough teachers to do what they've always wanted to do with kids but have never been allowed to do and then there's enough choices for kids to opt into what lights their fire and so we what we did is we took 90 minute periods and we attached these to lunch and so every single day kids get lunch for 40 minutes and the other 50 minutes they go to these classes every single day so if the only reason a teacher has to wake up is to be able to play with rockets and teach trick kids into high school level physics and math through playing with rockets then that teacher is going to do that every single day and the 32 kids who unfortunately are mainly boys if the only reason they have to get out of bed every single day so they can go play with rockets and be tricked into high school level physics and math then we're going to make that happen every day and what it did especially for a very poor school is in california at title one schools you the sort of the common approach is to pile more interventions on kids and what we had seen at the old schools there was an inverse relationship with the data that the more interventions that the kids had the lower their academic achievement and their higher their rates of discipline which is like totally counterintuitive and opposite of what you would hope to get. And what we found immediately by offering classes kids would want to go to every day and a more engaging pedagogy in the core areas of math and science and history and English, that discipline essentially vanished compared to what we were used to. And so now we have a bad day and I think about, ooh, bad rough day with kids. I think about what a normal bad rough day with kids is and it still ain't nothing. It's just our perspective has changed a little bit. So we really try and use time and space very carefully within a traditional structure, a traditional district school, don't have the flexibility of X blocks and other things that um, people are able to do some places, but what can we do to still capture the hearts and minds of kids in a creative, innovative way? I love that. And I think you hit the nail on the head that you also are capturing the hearts and minds of your teachers. And you know, everyone say if your teachers aren't happy and fulfilled and loving their space, it's hard for them to create that for um, for students. And you can find that in pockets. You can find it anywhere. But people often tell me, Katie, I'm the only one doing this in my school, or I feel so isolated and alone. And that's a hard space to be. That's hard to sustain that when you feel like you're always moving up against a system who doesn't support you and support your ideas. Um, and I know. So I want to jump to Caleb, who. Does, you do lots of great things at High Tech High, but I see some really awesome projects and ideas, and I'm wondering if you can share some of your favorite um, projects that you've seen um, in your school or around that really kind of hit on empowering kids and the things that they can do in school. Mm. Yeah, great question. So um, I want to tie back to this whole point around like um, adult engagement, because I think as, as Eric so beautifully just laid out, um, that is really, in my mind, like the, the essential ingredient um, is um, helping, identifying, noticing, and feeding the fire that, that is in each teacher. I think if there's anything I miss about the classroom the most is I miss being like with kids and watching like their excitement, their frustration, their relief after they do something that's awesome and amazing. Um, and if you think about maybe even some of your best professors in college, there were always these people who were like a little zany, but really passionate about their work. And I think, you know, what I see here is every teacher extremely passionate about their, their discipline, about their stance in life, maybe even beyond discipline. Like they have issues that they are concerned with in the world. They may be environmental issues, issues of social justice or 
um, wrongful incarceration or um, sending kids to the, or sending people to Mars. Um, I mean, they have a wide range of interest. And so, uh, but fundamentally all those things are a trick. It really is all about just what's the way to get the bee to the honey, right? And for us, it's like um, projects, they come in all shapes and forms. Here's one that pops to mind right now. Margaret, and it's not a big flashy one. I, I share a lot of stuff about what kids are doing. I just, it just makes me happy to do so. Um, but sometimes it's things that are, aren't flashy. Uh, Margaret Egler is um, our 12th grade humanities teacher. Um, you can follow her at uh, M. Egler uh, at, on Twitter. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. And so, uh, but she uh, does this um, really great reverse poetry that's about who you are. So for example, let's say, Katie, you're the teacher and you've got the unfortunate consequence of having me and Eric in your class. God. <laughs> So here's how this would work. Um, my job would be to interview Eric and write poetry about his life and then bring it to Eric for him to critique and give me feedback about it. Um, and then I create something that symbolizes Eric Shigela's life experience, right? And then Eric would have to do the same thing for me. And it's this, this, deep, sort, this deep sense of like empathy, human connection, that is really, to me, like the foundational work of what we do here. People think about us as a project-based school. Project is a trick. What we're about is equity. We're about like, how do you intentionally interrogate your life experience? Who and what have been the forces that have shaped your sense of identity? And more importantly, like, what might be the forces that might help you become the person that you're meant to be? And without some sort of way to really critique um, and interrogate your experience, then you, you, you really don't have an education unless you understand like who you are, your standing in the world, your relationship with other people, and your collective ability to take action in the world in some way. Like that's the shit. And so that's what we pursue. And so whether it's Margaret Egler's project where one student interviews another and they understand and they go to each other's houses and they like they get a full scope of a, of a student or you've got projects like um brian delgado and angela rario's rocketry project right where kids are building rockets and they've got to get permits from nasa in order to send them up to thirteen thousand feet above the surface of the earth but it's not about the project really what it is about is the reflection on the experience. Old school Dewey stuff. Like it's not just the doing of the thing, but it's your ability to reflect on, um, I tried to launch a rocket, it failed miserably, especially if I did it, it failed miserably. So what can I like, go back to the, to, to, the, to the literature or to the theoretical constructs of physics, lift, drag, all those kind of things, and like understand how to do it better, that's content. The second kind of reflection is about like, how did we work together as a group? Who was quiet? And what was a way that I could have acted to pull that person to the conversation? They have genius in them. How do I work in a way to bring the genius out of the group? And then the last part of that reflection is your own like, your own like progress. Like what, what were the stumbling blocks for me? Where did I fail? And where were the places where I was like, totally like in my, in my flow state, jamming, doing my thing. Like that reflection over and over and over and over again, I think puts us in this position as a uh, position, like I think it's Alvin Toffler who said, like the, the literate of the 21st century would be those people who can learn, unlearn and relearn, or, um, and it's in particular about like how to um, recreate yourself over time. And you do that through, um, through reflection, and action and reflection and action over and over and over and over again. Love it. Yeah, I mean, really, that we say the lifelong worker is a lifelong learner, right? That person who has always got to be learning and figuring out their space. So I'm curious, and this I'm going to throw it out to kind of all three of you guys. 
we hear time and time again that collaboration, working together is what jobs want, it's what companies want, it's what we want to see in our kids in our classrooms, it's what we want and know is going to support our teachers to do great things. Um, yet it's a constant struggle. How do, we, how do we intentionally create these meaningful collisions? How do we get people to collaborate and not just say, hey, go in a room and work together, but like, how do you create the conditions so people can really meaningful, meaningfully collaborate and work together and get the skills to, to do that in different groups? So they have to see the value. All right, and I see what we're talking adults right now? Yeah, I mean, and any adults. We also talk about kids. How do you build? I would also say adults who don't know how to collaborate can't facilitate the effective collaboration in their classroom. So yep. just like adults who won't take a risk can't embed that ideology of it okay being able to take risks with their kids, or adults who don't think that they are creative can't inspire the creative genius of the children for which they're working because the kids have bullshit screens the size of their iPads and they see right through it. So I, I think one of the big things with adults with collaboration is that we are not in the, and this is the same with kids, we're not in the world or the land of cooperation, that we are in the land of collaboration and they have to see the value in working with one another. And it goes back to design thinking and the power of um, creative movements that come when you throw people with disparate mindsets and ideas and backgrounds together. So the political scientist and the ballerina and the photographer and the mechanical engineer, people who have all those specialties and putting them on a group and a team together and seeing what comes out. I'm not interested in three people who love drama and seeing what they produce because I can guess what that's going to be like. And so they have to see the value in working with one another in a highly collaborative state and they have to understand what the hopeful expected outcomes are not what the outcome is in terms of it's already preset, but this is what we're hoping you will achieve. And these are the constraints that you can do it under. And so therefore the constraints help build creativity. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I'm so I'm going to pause for a minute because I sorry, uh, was that wrong? Was that wrong? No. I was wrong. <laughs> it was not wrong. It was perfect. You have I just got fired by Cutie Martin. <laughs> zone. I was in the zone and I was just so like mesmerized and I, was like, yes. and I also at the same time want to make sure I pause before I go on to anyone else to follow up on that meaningful thought Eric that we have only 15 minutes and I want to get some audience questions while I see if um, Caleb or John have any follow up oh yeah sure I do absolutely I love everything Eric just said. And, um, oh my God, that makes my heart glow. Um, I would also say, like, there is something about believing in magic. Magic, baby. Magic makes the world go round, okay? What I mean is, like, the, the thing that happens that you could not do solely by yourself. Magic happens when you get one in one in a room and they create what seems to be a three or four level idea, right? It's this, uh, it's this sense of like synergy that happens. It's beautiful. However, in order to get there, it takes a certain amount of humility. If you know it all, then there's nothing that anybody can tell you. It doesn't matter what kind of collaboration you try to bring together. I think there's something to be said about a leader's role in being humble. I think there's a, um, something to be said about leading with uh, questions that are provocative and interesting to pursue versus giving answers. Um, when, when people um, approach the work with the disposition of curiosity, a sense of imaginative play, and a sense of reflection, like that helps to create, in my mind, at least um, the undergirding sort of dispositions. But bigger picture, like things you can actually see, is when two people or two disciplines work together in a way to complement each other and meet the, the goal, the objective, the, the thing that you're trying to work on. That collaboration, just as we would think about um, 
um, organizing any sequence of other learning like mathematics or engineering or physics. Um, there are protocols and methods to um, for adults that to support collaborative dialogical conversations. You know as well as I do, you can't just put adults in a room and just say, work on something beautiful and make something great out of it. They need a way to even a challenge. And there, there are a ton of amazing protocols from the National School Reform Faculty and others to help support adult um, and how adults learn and understand together, how they make decisions together. So I have a thought I, I would love to share. Um, I love just kind of what I heard there, you know, uh, especially the 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 magic, the the idea that you're going to take it to the next level as a group, uh, as a team. And I think there's a couple of thoughts I have. Um, the first one to kind of mirror um, what Eric said about you know collaboration versus cooperation. Um, yeah, I, I actually did kind of a, a blog series on this whole topic of collaborative projects, and uh, one of the one of the I did like I I, I love doing these little sketch videos. So I did collaboration versus cooperation as like a little sketch video, and um, one of the things I really believe is that uh, for good collaboration to work, from a design perspective, you have to design it in a way where people are have to work interdependently where they need to rely on each other and so i think like in design thinking it means that when they're engaged in research they have to be able to depend on the information they get from each other when they're doing an ideation they can't just brainstorm together as a group they have to work separately and then come together and give and you have to have structures in place where every person gets a chance to have their voice validated um, those pieces have to be there. Um, otherwise, it becomes four people doing the equivalent of just a one person project. And I think that happens with students all the time. That happens with um, teachers. And the, the other piece is they have to be, you know, there truly has to be authentic voice and choice. So I've worked, for example, in a school where the PLC was the forced collaboration but we didn't function as a real PLC because everything was so top down that there was no chance to have any autonomy and agency at the bottom level. So that, I think, is the other part. And then the last thing I just want to say is a little bit of a pushback on the collaboration piece is, yes, collaboration is critical. But in the best collaborative environments I've ever worked in, there is space for individual autonomy and just the ability to engage in deep work by yourself that contributes to the team. And I think that's where mixed ability grouping, that's where mixed interest grouping, mixed talent grouping becomes so vital. But as much as collaboration is a huge part of what students will need in the future, in a distracted world, they also need to know how to engage in self-directed, autonomous, deep work. And that piece, yeah. I, I think, is the other part that will bring collaboration to the next level. I love that, John, too, because it goes back to what we were talking about with strengths and in individuals. If you're always just interdependent with the group, you don't always have to think about what you bring and what you can go and do um, individually with that. And I think that's that's important. At the end of the day, there needs to be some accountability. And there's always the struggle of, like, it's the group work. Let's do a group project and grade everyone together. You know, in in real world, you are held accountable often by your own goals, and you need the group to support you in that. But you have to be able to do it on your own. Too. So I really push back and that perspective. Uh, you know, Katie, I would th I would also say that 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 sense of contribution, just jumping in a quick sec, yeah. is 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 not antithetical to um, collaboration. Collaboration is sometimes we can think of it as a fixed thing, but there are like sub constructs related to, um, to collaboration, like cooperation, like conflict resolution, like making contributions or expanding on the contributions of others. There are like sub constructive sort of behaviors that make up this larger idea of collaboration. 
And I'll, I'll share, I think I'm stealing this from Eric and it's unfair because you're right here, but I know you often, <laughs> you can jump in, but um, Eric will always say, you gotta teach people how to do these things. You can't just expect those subcontracts. You have to teach people, and, and I love that you've organized your school and your design, um, whatever, the design um, classes around, how do you teach people how to present, how to work together, how to do these things, and not just give them a rubric and expect them to figure it out. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm gonna just speak for you there, Eric, so I can move on to that. We have two awesome questions that I wanna make sure to get to, and I wanna hear your voice on this too. So Christy Croft um, at kcroft23 has a question um, that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. What is the best way to approach someone when you want to buddy up and tackle design thinking together? So you're in a school by yourself. How do you go for it? So I, I would say maybe focus less on the process and focus on the challenge. Uh, sometimes we can get enamored with like, oh, let's use design thinking. Mm, that's not bad. Um, um, a wise course of action might be, what is a thing that is on our heart that we want to tackle together? And then as we try to tackle that thing, who is impacted? That's empathy. There might be some needs that are related to this thing that we're like working on. So what we're trying to do is, instead of like learning by like talking about doing design, um, it might be a moment to think about using design um, versus talking. Yeah, I, Caleb, I think that's really brilliant. And uh, that sort of that cornerstone where people can find each other and really dig in around real work is around that challenge. And what we find is like you really bond over that empathy, that journey that you're going on. And, you know, it's kind of like a lightning rod when you go back to remember when we generated all those really great ideas. And we go back all the time like, oh, remember that? And that's that's how we kind of get stuck on the, oh, we're not using our process. Like, remember how good that felt when we did? And a lot of bonding, I think, that happens over that and through that. Oh, okay, so one of the things that um, I would say to your point, Eric, talking about um, working together and focusing on the, on the work, one of my colleagues, I love it, she always reminds us we're trying to build culture and really focusing on how we create a really meaningful culture at work, and she'll always remind us, let's just do good work together. If we focus on doing good work together and not, as to your point, the nacho party or all the other things that we get caught up in, when we focus on good work together, it motivates us and inspires us and builds those bridges. Um, I just wrote a post recently about student engagement connected to engagement in the workforce, and they're trying all of these things, ping pong tables, all these parties, all these great happy hours, and employee performance isn't going up, nor is employee engagement, because they're short-term fixes, and if we keep focusing on like the thing and these short-term fixes, rather than building meaningful, um, deep, sustained work. That's what we're internally motivated to do, and that's what actually inspires and motivates people to do good work. Yeah. I, they don't want, John has something so awesome to say, and if you No, it's okay, I just want to point out, like, yeah, like, yeah. Have to be with people that you want to work with. And I think the relationship. I got him. He. I lost him because it was. Can you hear me? I feel like my internet connection sucks right now. Can you hear me at all right now? Now I can hear you. Go. All right. I. I, I do think that like the best collaboration that I ever worked on. The, the, the times where design thinking worked were times where we had relationships. All right, I gotta, I gotta cut him. <laughs> you, can, you can write a blog about it. <laughs> oh, sorry, dude. Hey, oh. Katie, one, of, one of the things we 
that I talk to people about sometimes, Katie, is this idea of um, everyone's on a continuum and really like the, whether it's a teacher leader or a school leader or whatever, like our job is to be a concierge and to help determine what the needs of each unique user are and really help serve to those needs to get them to where they want to go. And if, and if you really want to, like, if you're intentionally trying to like really learn more about design, um, and you have maybe you you're thinking of a, a topic um, or a, an area of need that you want to try to address maybe find just one partner who's interested in that same thing and then use the design process to kind of start the work I think there are two places where people really get connected to design one is in doing like real interviews with people where you like are seeking stories seeking stories of emotional significance to be exact when you're looking for like pain points in a person's life or experience or things that brought them delight and joy those things that's one particular attachment point i think the second is when you begin to like use those emotional pain points or or points of joy and you begin um prototyping something to meet that need and then you put that in the in their hands and you get to like see their reaction to that is another place where people really find I don't know some joy um well I mean sometimes you go we are way off base by the way you like your prototype is off and and but but normally people are pretty flexible about that and they're just like hey you know you know it didn't quite work out the way I hoped but you still learn something about it and maybe in a different, different way. And, but those are like two places where, I don't know, where you really see like the human value is when you create something that meets an authentic need, that sort of service to others is humbling and really powerful. Yeah, and I'll just finish that up with um, John's comment too. And he was just saying, although he can't share, what do you <laughs> Just saying, it starts, Sorry, John. You never sounded better. Yeah. Starts with the relationship of trust, and it really starts with choosing to be vulnerable. And I think so. Back to the question, Percy, if we're really looking at be vulnerable, say that you, you know, think of a problem you want to solve, talk to somebody about what you want to accomplish, and then how you can use different processes to support that. I'm going to wrap us up with a question from Dan Ryder. The oh, Dan Ryder. What up? And he has a question, of course, a super thoughtful and insightful question for everybody. And John, no matter how bad your audio is, we're going to let you share. Um, but I'm going to let you keep it to like 30 seconds because it's, it's good and it's going to just, that's going to be the final thought. So in a world where there's so much happening and these, you know, everyone is innovative and pushing boundaries, Dan is asking, how do you for rekindle your spirits when your innovator souls are wounded or hurting? Mm -hmm. Everyone's thinking, Dan, it's thoughtful. Who wants to jump in? Go, I, go Caleb. Go ahead, Eric. No, no, no. All right. He's before beauty, dude. So 30 seconds. When we are wounded, I think the best source of rejuvenation is in service to other people. Um, so anytime that, you know, you feel that, that sense of fatigue, I'm, I'm reminded that the work that we're trying to do is about liberation, about unleashing people, their creative souls, their creative mojo. And um, that freedom, even though we might feel tired, we should maybe think about, yes, we're tired, name it, but not fatigued. This is civil rights level work we're trying to do. And there are lots of people, including minority students, low-income kids all across this country who are locked in these paradigms of compliance and locked into these patterns that uh, just perpetuate inequity. Um, and we got, we got work to do, man. Thanks, Bob. I'd say a more self, on the more selfish note, which is typical for me versus Caleb, <laughs> is trying to reconnect with the like-minded souls that help give me hope that this work is doable. And so that may be ironically with Dan Ryder eating pizza on a corner at 2 a.m. in Austin. And that may be, 
getting wings with Caleb Rashad on a Sunday afternoon or going on a walk on the beach with Doug Creedeman. But it is finding those like-minded souls who are doing the work that know how hard it is, how lonely it can be, and they re-energize and help keep that your eye on the ball of this is why we do this. This is why we're pushing. This is why we're working. The kids deserve it. Every single darn one of them, rich, poor, in between, they all deserve better than what the traditional system is giving them. Okay, I'm going to try to answer, and I have no idea if it's going to work. So here's what I think. Um, know the difference between being tired and being wounded. Because being tired requires rest, but if you're wounded, you need to be restored. And that requires community. That requires something bigger than yourself. Um, you know, for me, there's a faith component, but there's, there is a... Uh, know what restores you because if you've been wounded you need to be restored to 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 have your cup fill so that you can give it away to other people awesome thank you guys and i will just finish off by um what really restores me is the community just like you guys said like the people who support me and push me who help me think differently and um, so many of them are here on this screen, and I thank you for being here, for my friends, my dear colleagues, and the iMoot community. I'm super thankful for what you guys um, put out into the world, how you support one another, and how you support me and um, energize me constantly. So that is going to be a wrap for tonight. Thank you, Caleb and Eric and John, for taking your time and sharing your insights. Please connect with them all on Twitter, um, tons of resources on John's blog, and um, I'm sure both Eric and Caleb are happy to answer questions and share more resources with you if you connect with them. So that is it for tonight. Keep blogging, sharing, and connecting, and keep learning and making an impact in your own community. And we will see you soon. Good night. Good night.